John White attacked a 17-year-old girl and left his 26-year-old mistress dead. Despite all that, he only served 14 years for both crimes, reformed his life, and became a minister, and even with his gruesome past, was accepted with open arms. But it was just an act, and his sick, twisted fantasy came to fruition on Halloween of 2012, where he gave new meaning to the devil's holiday. Let's get into the crazy, demented mind of John D. White. Hi guys, my name is Jillian and welcome to Unwind and Mystery. Yeah, where you unwind and chill out with me as I talk about a true crime case. If you guys have seen any of my videos, you know in every video I use a face mask. Today, that is not going to be the case. This is my second time recording this video. The first video I used a paper mask and it had acid in it. For acne, I have a little bit of acne. I don't think my acne is strong enough for that mask and it burnt my face up. I don't think my face can handle another mask. So for now, I'm just gonna use some eye masks. And they're just moisturizing hydrogel eye masks. And before I start, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Please give this video a like and share this video with whoever the heck you want. Now let's get into the story. On October 31st of 2012, Halloween, 24-year-old Rebecca Gay was nowhere to be found. The news of her disappearance spread like wildfire in her small town of Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Everyone was very confused and worried as to why Rebecca would just get up and leave. She didn't have the easiest life, but it was definitely getting better. She was in a loving relationship with her boyfriend, Aaron, and had a three-year-old son named Conway, who she absolutely adored, and wanted to build a more stable life for herself and her son. And luckily, this was about to happen for her thanks to her new promotion at her job as a cashier. Police wasted no time opening up an investigation into her disappearance and looked everywhere for her or for any clues or any information pertaining to her case. And at her church at Christ Community Fellowship, her pastor John D. White was telling his congregation to keep praying for Rebecca and to keep hope alive that she will return home sooner than later. But John wasn't this great child of God like he portrayed himself at church. He was a very dark individual. When he was younger, he enrolled in the Navy, and after leaving, he became a truck driver. He had since married and was living in Battle Creek, Michigan when he was 22 years old. He had a neighbor who was five years younger than him, 17-year-old Teresa Etherton. One day in 1980, he invited Teresa over to his house to look at his racetrack, but he had ulterior motives. He led her down to his basement, and when he saw his opportunity, he took it and attacked her. He choked Teresa and stabbed her multiple times, 15 times to be exact. He thought and intended to leave her for dead, but luckily she survived this maniac's attack and went straight to police. She said that when John attacked her, he was smiling. He held her hand and kissed her on her lips and told her, you're going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but WTF, you're just a woman. I'm not really sure what that means, but okay, you creep. John pleaded no contest the following year and received 10 years in jail for this, which was great, but he appealed this saying his attorney didn't give him an insanity defense. And unfortunately, at this time, his attorney was no longer alive to make any comments on this, but it is assumed that the reason he didn't do an insanity plea was because if he did, John probably would have gotten off. He also said he had partial amnesia and he was able to successfully appeal his sentence after serving just two years for this, and he was given two years probation. Teresa was upset. She felt abandoned by the police and the courts, and obviously she was scared that the guy who tried to murder her was now out and a free man. After his appeal, John didn't stop there. This was just the beginning of his evil wrath. So we know John was married. He also had a son, and his wife was pregnant with their second child. He was working at a textile company doing maintenance when he met 26-year-old Vicki Sue Wall in 1994. The two started having an affair together and would often sneak around. In July of 1994 at 3 a.m., John picked Vicky up at a grocery store parking lot. I'm not sure why they were at a grocery store parking lot at 3 a.m., but I digress. This was the last time anyone had seen or heard from Vicky, so of course they bring in John for questioning. At first, he told police he knew nothing about nothing, but when they told John, they actually had surveillance footage 
of him picking up Vicky. He admitted to picking her up but said that he brought her home and has no clue where she is, hasn't spoken to her since. Police thought he was a sketchy weirdo and were pretty sure that he killed her but they didn't have enough evidence to hold him so he was free. But six weeks later her body was found in the woods about two miles from where John picked her up at the grocery store. She was completely naked and her shirt and bra were around her neck. But unfortunately since so much time had passed since her murder and she was in the woods with wild animals, her body had already decomposed and it was impossible for police to say what her cause of death was. So police think back to the weird conversation they had with John and search his car. They didn't find much there. John had cleaned his car pretty good, but they were able to find a blood spatter by using a chemical called luminol and that was enough for them. They brought John in and find out that he actually attempted to take his life with a mixture of pills and alcohol and told detectives that he had blackouts and he thinks he does really bad things when he's blacked out. They didn't know why he did what he did, but figured it was so he could keep their affair his dirty little secret. And of course, his nasty little deceitful self said that even though he killed her, it wasn't on purpose. He was so in love with her, so he would never have done something like that on purpose. He then refused to take a lie detector test and stopped talking to detectives about this in general. He got 8 to 15 years for pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter. John was paired with a psychologist while serving his sentence and he told them that he had a very deranged fantasy of killing women and having sex with their dead bodies. Disgusting. But 12 years had passed and John had now found God, honey, and he was on his way to repentance. He was released from jail on February 11th of 2007 and he was now going to be a new man. He had a new life now. He moved to Mount Pleasant in a trailer park and even got himself a fiance named Sally Gay who was Rebecca Gay's mother. And he started his path of ministry at the Christ Community Fellowship Church. You would think, oh, okay, he's a minister and he didn't tell anybody about his past. But his past was no secret. They all knew about it at the church. He somehow was able to manipulate them and to believing that his past was no longer who he was. Even though he attempted to kill a child and murdered his mistress, that was all in his past so it didn't matter anymore. He repented and his sins were now washed away. But his son said that his dad never changed. He knew he wasn't all there mentally, he admitted it, but he never wanted to talk about it anymore and never sought help for this. But his little holy act could not and did not last long. And his dark fantasy he told the psychologist about all those years later started to manifest again. And that's all he could think about just five years after being released from prison. On Halloween morning of 2012, John got very, very drunk and decided to pay his fiance's daughter, Rebecca, a visit at 2 a.m. She was home with her son and was definitely not expecting any guest. But she was used to John. John was her mom's fiance. He would often watch her son. So even though it's very strange for him coming in her house at 2 a.m., it's not like he was a stranger. John goes into her trailer and brutally attacks her with the mallet, knocking her unconscious. He put a zip tie around her neck and choked her to death. He then drove a mile away and dumped her body into the woods. And after this, he watched her son Conway put him in his Halloween costume and dropped him off at his dad's house to celebrate the holiday. Rebecca had worked that day. She was a hard worker. She barely ever missed work. And when she doesn't show, her coworkers start to get very worried and reported her missing. And those are some amazing coworkers because my coworkers in the past, some of them probably would have given zero clucks if I showed up from work unless they were extremely understanding and needed my help. John's lunatic self decided to confess what he did to his church and took them to her body. Of course police were called and he was taken in. He admitted to thinking of murdering her two weeks before he actually did and engaging in sexual acts with her body. Just so we're clear, with her body that was no longer alive. He said he watched porn of people doing this before he actually went over to her house. And the fact that there are websites that show people doing this is disgusting and should be taken off the internet forever. He told them that even though he took her clothes off, he couldn't remember if he had sex with her corpse or not. He does say that he did want to and that was his intention, but he couldn't get aroused down there. I wonder why. Honestly, it's probably not even because he was grossed out. It was probably because he was drunk. 
Rebecca's mom, Sally, pleaded with the courts to give John the worst punishment they could and to show him absolutely zero mercy. She told John that for 20 excruciating hours, they prayed that Rebecca would come home. She was not yours to take. How dare you? Which is my feeling about all murderers. It really infuriates me, this thinking that killers have, that somebody that they don't know, even if they know them, that their fate is up to them. It's like they tried to play God. I hate that there's a lot of things that make me mad about killers but that is the one thing especially with kidnapping like who am I for you to take like they go out and take people's kids that's not your kid that mentality I will never understand John was given 56 years in jail on April 18th of 2013 for second degree murder and honestly he should never have been freed in the first place I was reading and they said that certain laws were not in place at the time and at this time if he was in jail for everything he did previously, especially being a multiple offender, he definitely would not have been let out. So I guess that's some positivity. But with the other women's lives he took, he did the same thing with his own 10 days later. And just 10 days into his sentencing, he hung himself in his cell on August 28th of 2013. And he was found at 4.38 a.m. And I bet he repented for his sins right before he hung himself too. But that is the story story of John White and the murder of two innocent victims. This story was a little shorter than my usual, but I hope you guys found some enjoyment of hearing me talk about this sick, demented man. I feel like I say that about everybody I talk about. If you made it to the end, thank you so much for staying. Please make sure you subscribe to my channel. Leave me a comment telling me what you thought about this case. Please like this video and share it with whoever you want. And I will see you guys later this week. Toodles!